over the last years, we've been uploading more and more of our photo and video data to the internet, either voluntarily through YouTube and Facebook and Instagram, I guess, and also without our knowledge through security cameras, coupled with an increase in machine learning, AI research, and all of that, I think we are all quite concerned about the privacy implications, but it's going farther than that. And our next speaker is looking at what the implications are for our society as a whole, for our culture. So he's an activist, he's a digital rights advocate, and he's a tech ethicist. Please welcome to the stage. Matthew Stender. Woo! Just want to let you know, if you want to move up, be awesome. If you want to leave at any time, no worries. Like, uh, I know it's late in the <coughs> late at camp. Everybody's probably getting a nap for some party tonight. But, <coughs> excuse me, while we're here, let's talk about the future. My name is Matthew Stender. I call myself a tech ethicist. I'm really interested in the, both the cultural and ethical implications of emerging technology. Kind of this question, what does it mean to be human in the 21st century? Other things like, what is the social contract that humans and the machines that we've built, but that are becoming more and more than just tools, what is the, what is the social contract that we can expect? What is, an, what is a reasonable expectation of privacy when we live in an age of ubiquitous surveillance? So, <clears throat> in my talk today, I am gonna run through, it, in some ways, the, the kind of first half is going to be a update on what is going on as far as uh, facial recognition technology, how it's being deployed in countries around the world, how, it is become, how our faces are now becoming uh, an access control vector, um, and what does it mean that an image, once it's taken in a digital format, can continuously be processed and added new and have new layers of information added to it? All right. So, I first really got interested in the idea of, of ubiquitous surveillance and particularly facial recognition technology because I feel it's an interesting nexus that combines sociological, um, psychological, but also technological um, forces. What I mean by that is when we are walking down the street, well, let's say 50 years ago, 60 years ago, walking down the street, you could in some ways be anonymous. Maybe somebody could see you, but there was very little record of you being there. Now, with 24-hour-a-day CCTV cameras, those that have the access to these to databases in which to collect visual information can rewind. They can also see where their other eyes are around town and actually map out our trajectory throughout the real space in which that we occupy. So, with that, um, this is going to be this is uh, six things from a talk that I'm giving in an hour and a half. But I wanted to start with this. Um, I have been working on a theory. We call it hashtag mimics. But when it comes down to proprietary algorithms, proprietary platforms, I'm very concerned that there are a lot of, ex a lot of forces that can be exerted on our information flow that create a, increase the signal to static ratio between information sources and us. So this is a theory that, I've, that I'm continuing to develop. I call it MIMICS, and it stands for Monitor, Index, Manipulate, Intercept, Sensor, and Silo. So these are, these are six forces in which that the proprietary nature, the black box nature of proprietary algorithms um, can, can interact with our information and eventually nudge us into consumption decisions or other decisions in which we, not, we may not have even known that uh, they, were, they were acting on us. <clears throat> so, let's, let's take a look at this. When it comes to the mass proliferation of image and video technology uh, that, that is, uh, surrounds us, it is pretty mind-blowing that 100,000 people, or nearly 100,000, or nearly, sorry, mil nearly a million people log into Facebook every day. That um, 1.8 million snaps are created in an internet minute. 
I mean, Snapchat's new. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I think that Snapchat has been very impressive in the way that it's been able to be outside, it's been able to resist, um, been able to resist uh, purchases by Facebook, and now has had its IPO. We'll see how that goes. I don't personally use Snapchat, but y'all have probably all seen at least a Snapchat interface in which an augmented reality layer uses vector mapping on a face in order to create filters. This is actually a pretty sophisticated piece of technology. Vector mapping, I think, is a pretty exciting thing. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But it just goes to show that now, as commercial products are being uh, put out that we use as fun, there also is technology that's being uh, developed um, <clears throat> that goes into, uh, it goes into something like a Snapchat. So I mentioned this a little earlier. This is, um, uh, this is uh, some bullet points, uh, paraphrase from a piece uh, in the New Inquiry by Trevor uh, Paglin uh, called Invisible Images. And this, this was an, when, I, when I read this piece, it got me interested in this, in this dichotomy of the idea of how we see an image as always static, but the systems that we put it into can continually churn and be able to draw out information that may not have been apparent when the first kind of cycling through of this image. So, so Trevor Begins talks about um, that a photograph shot on a phone creates a machine-readable file. And I think this is a really interesting uh, first point, that we are not creating images that are human-first readable. We are now creating machine-readable first, and we actually need a subsidiary or another a photo viewing app in order to see visually what, the, what our phone has captured. The, and secondly, that images do not need to be turned, on, uh, turned into human-readable forms in order for machines to do, to do something with it. That, we, that there may never be a human-readable file, but information that's captured um, is, still being, is still being processed. And um, the implications of this are that the, the automation of vision at this scale, which would talked about in the, the first slide, 1.8 million snaps per minute, um, this sort of enormous scale um, and so is, is, is something that we've never seen before, right? The computing power that it used to take to, I don't know, even put you know, images into a system for CCTV cameras, manage the, the information flow, especially in an analog sense, people needed tapes and tapes and VHSs and maybe DVDs, whatever it may be, but now on um, on such a small device, we're able to, uh, of, with solid state memories and, and other things, we're able to put so much information in one small space. So I, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the, the kind of ecosystem that's going on. Um, and this is that what we're seeing now is a mode of development, a mode of technology development that is diverging in two ways, at least in my opinion. And this is the corporatization of, of services, um, but this is also nation states developing technology to further their interests. So, so um, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, who had at the time the most advanced, had the world's experts in facial recognition and vision, um, uh, vision technology and neural networks, they, these people were all based at Carnegie Mellon. What did Uber do? They poached 40 of the top researchers in this field and now they're working for what I would consider a pretty shitty, you know, a pretty shitty company. Um, it's an interesting interplay in which that now there's commercial or economic motives for the brightest minds in the world to not, in, not to put, use their talents for the betterment of humanity, but for individual corporations. On the other side of this is nation states that Baidu and other companies um, uh, in China are now. Um, are now doing some amazing things. Uh, I mean, Facebook and Google as well, but, uh, but China right now is, has some of the, the, not only the top uh, supercomputers, but they're also doing, they're also pioneering uh, machine learning, neural networks, and other things um, on their own accord. Why I find this interesting is because if we're talking about modes of technological development, what, what, are, what do we expect? What are the motives that drive the, the entities that create this technology? If we look at China, even the, the Chinese computer scientists and others that are programming this, I find it quite interesting in that the boxes, the linguistic boxes in which that code is entered into, um, is entered into uh, through programming languages 
also has what I consider a cultural DNA. That a character, that each character representing a, a syllable in Chinese is different from a string of, of, of characters in a Latin alphabet. And so I, I think that it's really interesting, um, at least for me, to, to think about the, the ways in which that different entities are pioneering different te technologies, um, but they all bring something different. They all bring their own motives in, into the mix. So these are three things that I believe that are going to be important um, factors in what I consider a next epoch. Um, this is an epoch of the, a changed relationship between humans and technology. So I'm going to talk about the, I'm going to talk about these three things and some other things, but talk about how machines see us, how we see each other through the lens of machines, and how we view what we now consider machines. Right. So <clears throat> let's delve into this into this uh, a little bit. So personally, I lack the agency. I don't have the ability to control how a CCTV camera or Facebook uh, or Instagram running neural networks on the uploaded uh, digital content is sees me. What kind of sovereignty it gives me as an individual or how I'm packaged together with groups of similar people. Um, and this really does, I believe, impact our identity. I'll get into this a little more lately. As, I, as, I, as AI is incorporated into new platforms, this will become increasingly pronounced. We see this all the time. AI is going to do this. Let's, let, uh, let's outsource decisions to that. So what about you? So I'm up here. You're down there. We can all see each other in this room. But if we think about unnetworked humans, what I call the next billion, the next billion people that have never touched a network device, right? But soon, more and more people, every day, more and more people are have a phone in their hands. When it comes to places like India and Bangladesh that have um, a high rate of, of digital adoption, half just by the scale of their populations, um, but there are still a lot of unnetworked humans. So how is somebody that is not even on Facebook or Snapchat or these other systems, how, what, it, what is their identity? What does their sovereignty of self look like in the context when they're still being passively captured, whether in the background of selfies or on CCTV, or soon with self-driving cars that have both LiDAR and cameras around it, what, are, what, are, what is the ability for people that are not inside of these corporate silos to actually control the way that they're seen? And ultimately, when I'm thinking about technology, um, you know, what are the communication strategies that we need to develop um, and the the body of epistemic reality, this new, the way that we learn things, um, how will this inform um, humans when we're dealing with not just one type of AI, but many different types of AI that all have these optical nerves that are essentially digital eyes? So, machine learning, neural networks. So, Megaface is a database um, set up by a university in California, and it is like one of the most um, important test data sets. So it's a, it's a training set with over 4.5, 4.5 million photos um, with yeah, nearly a million uh, unique identities. And um, there's, so there's some overlap. So people are able to have different photos of themselves and this, are able to train things. Um, but it, I find it quite interesting that one database is kind of the standard for machine learning. I'm going to talk about um, how this is problematic and even the idea of why we need to further interrogate test data and training data. Um, but I just wanted to set this up there because this is kind of the premier, a lot of the, um, a lot of the contests that are, that, are <clears throat> that are run use this, this database, the Megaface database. So as I said, like, we are getting more and like, every day it seems... Um, that there are new developments inside of facial recognition technology, and a lot of these are done for corporate capitalists' means. So Google is now um, linking offline, online habits and offline buying habits. Um, facial recognition technology um, is being used, it was being rolled out across the UK to, uh, to track uh, consumers. And um, I mentioned this, uh, Instagram has rolled out a neural network which now uh, looks at the background of photos and see where brands are and other things, and they're able to match up <clears throat> advertising ID with particular photos. But again, it's kind of weird. 
I upload something, and all of a sudden, it exists outside of my control and can be crawled by, by multiple processes. I'm not going to talk so much about emotional measure measurement, but um, there's a number of factors. So emotional measurement, um, at least with this example, uses at least 10 data points per frame. Um, we have the, kind of the vectors on the face. Uh, this is able to, there's emotional measurement that's able to work in real time, walking through a train station, and with, eight, with, um, at, with, at, uh, with at least eight frames per second, um, we're able to get, uh, tell um, the, the mood that people are in. And so this exists, but how is it being used? Well, here's two things in the last couple of weeks that have come out. <clears throat> And so we have, uh, we have a new technology that is now being employed for CCTV, CCTV cameras. But I think most interesting is this example. Now, um, Disney has a new patent that they're going to put an infrared camera behind the screen to be able to look out at you and see if you're smiling or not. So there's real-time real -time analysis being done on you, even though you are paying to engage in an entertainment product. And I think this is really interesting. What are the assumptions of once we paid for something, once we <clears throat> have been a consenting economic actor, have we given away our rights? <clears throat> are we okay with buying, <clears throat> excuse me, buying a concert ticket, paying 50 euros for a concert ticket, but at the same time there's drones and cameras and watching us and tracking us and we're using our wristbands to, to check in. So I think that like the agency in which that we're able to, to employ to be able to freely exist inside of space is actually, perhaps, hopefully not, but maybe diminishing. So I think um, so sovereignty over our identity as we move through place and space will be more important. Okay. Right now, a lot of things are fixed. They're stationary. We have Androids and Apples that are increasingly um, running more sophisticated technology on device, GPUs that then ping back to, to servers. But at the same time, once self-driving cars, automated vehicles come online, we're going to see more than just LiDAR, which is the satellite, which is the radar um, um, positioning that's used for kind of the cartography and the movement of space, but also see more images that are passed up once Tesla or Lyft or Uber in incorporates more images on their, their vehicles. When we're now on a street, we may get passed by four cars that all have a photo record of us being there. <clears throat> So now I'm going to talk about 10 different cities to say, like, to, to, to show, like, we, we are now in the future. So New York City is adding facial recognition and license plate readers to its river crossings. You go from one borough, borough to the next, they're going to know who you are. This is not just street-level surveillance. This is more than that. License plate readers um, are, are quite interesting in the sense that you can be parked and they can know something about it, but you, we cannot maybe draw a lot of conclusions from one particular license plate in one particular location. But through being placed at crossroads, at nexuses, at bridges, we're now, now those that have the power um, are able to now link up and see how often we go. We're, they're able to create um, maps of our, of our daily commutes, these sort of things. Um, I don't know if you've heard uh, Palantir, which is the Peter Thiel's like, big data company, um, actually just got into a fight with a New York PD, and so New York PD is actually not using them as a, <clears throat> as a service provider anymore. But it's just to say that this, this is article from October 7th, 2016, but the, Palantir was still a client of, the New York, of New York City. So we don't know. Maybe if you were in New York in the last six months, Palantir may have a record of your face, but you, we, we don't know that. Um, Another time, another uh, this is a, an example of a vulnerable population that is being used as a, as a petri dish for this technology. New York City is going to use, homeless, or use spatial recognition to, to track homeless people. So if you don't have a home, somehow your ability to not have your image taken is somehow decreased. Again, back to a social contract. We don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy when it comes to facial recognition technology. Berlin, where I live, um, in Sukhoi's uh, train station, there has now been um, a facial recognition technology rolled out on a pilot program, highly controversial, but controversy and public backlash did not stop them from doing this. 
and Berlin, Germany is being actually a quite privacy-centric um, country, um, this goes to show that this is, this is happening everywhere. <clears throat> Milan, um, the Milan Central train station, like, has a very interesting um, uh, new facial recognition technology program, but this is not for surveillance. It's actually a new ad platform. Right, so advertising totems in Milan's train station have facial recognition in order to collect passenger data without authorization. Um, again, going back to the different modes of development of these technologies, is it commercial? Is it a commercial development? Is it a national security development? Is it an economic advantage um, development? Um, is it something like emergency disaster response? Um, and so there's different ways in which this technology is being used, but as it gets more and more sophisticated, it is easier for large data sets or underlying code to be transportable. A few more. Japan grants aid to install face recognition systems worth $3.4 million in Pakistan's airports. Amsterdam, not far from here, testing facial recognition at boarding gates. Australia, say, oh, what if we uh, didn't have passports anymore? What if your face was your ticket? Again, British Airways BA is uh, using biometric scanners for faster airport check-in. And uh, the US administration has also fast-tracked facial recognition in airports. China. Um, China is now incorporating uh, 600 million CCTV cameras. It's a shit ton of CCTV cameras, eh? Um, and there's some quite interesting, I know, this, this story here is one of my favorites. <clears throat> Somebody's stealing the toilet paper. We could buy more toilet paper or we could install a draconian facial recognition system to stop these people. So for me, this is one of those things that is about how do we, how are policymakers and corporate entities constructive, constructively working to solve problems? And I feel too often the answer is let's let technology take care of it. Let's slap some AI and video cameras on it. This will do, this will do the job. And it doesn't stop there. China is now testing, uh, is, is using predictive AI to stop crimes before they happen. This is literally out of Minority Report, right? Ireland, where um, a lot of the large uh, headquarters for, for companies are, are based. Um, now driver's license to, to vehicles, so now faces get automatically uh, inputted. A whole registry can be inputted and, and, and matched. India, the, the Adar program, which is the new biometric ID. Has anybody been following the, uh, the case of India's new IDs? So I, I find this really interesting. This, as well as the currency swap, when the 510 rupee notes were, were changed overnight, the Modi administration did the largest currency swap in the history of the world without anybody even know it was coming. It was actually an impressive feat of logistics and, 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 and macro, uh, microeconomic, uh, and the country didn't collapse. I mean, there was, it was, I, I was blown away when I saw the scale and size of this currency exchange of, we're taking all these notes out of circulation tonight, and these are the new notes going in. And within a course of a few weeks, the, no, the smaller notes were no longer accepted. Why I think is interesting is because no technologies, no technolo technological, it, um, advancement exists in a vacuum. It doesn't exist in a bubble. There's other factors going on around it. And so when everyone now in India, 1.2, 1.3 billion people now have a biometric card that is essential for them to access public services, um, that, we, that now these, these things become, um, become more pressing. That the ability for those in power to oppress those that don't agree with them becomes more worrying. So, as we see here, there's a couple of case studies from the US. Oakland has all of this information from its street level surveillance programs and it doesn't really know what to do with it. Um, right before the, the most recent inauguration in January, um, police surveillance cameras were, were owned. Don't really know why, and there's actually been some pushback from DC Metropolitan Police and the FBI about actually not saying so much about this. Um, as far as I know, nobody is, is quite sure who did it or hasn't been publicized. But we talked about the bridges in New York City. 
but think about the information. You got one day of having of being able to move laterally through a CCTV network for a city the size of Washington D.C. We're now able to track diplomats, heads of state that are visiting, other important figures, and. With this sort of information, the ability of even one day snapshot, maybe it can't tell you everything, but you're still able to understand movements of people. You're still able to, to do mapping of, of social mapping and network mapping of these things. And so I, I think that when it comes to the vast, vast amount of information when it, of, of still and moving images of people, there is a lot to be done around uh, privacy controls. I call a theory I'm working on drone budsman, right? An ombudsman is someone who's responsible for a publication. It's, it's the person, uh, we can think of them as a public editor. Right now, that cities may have data protection officers, but with drone data, with CCTV camera, a lot of times these slip through the cracks and policy becomes uh, about information retention, how to dispose of it, but it's not actually um, interrogating why all this information is coming into a centralized uh, database. So, now I'm gonna talk about like um, some other things going on. Um, Taser, which you probably know from pop culture of um, a non-lethal weapon, they're Traditionally, I guess they come in two forms. One, a handheld that really gives out an electrical charge. The other have these uh, uh, nodes that go out and electrocute uh, someone who is being shot by them. But Taser is now getting into the AI, uh, machine learning, and to uh, visual analysis. So this really concerns me because if a police officer is wearing a body camera and they walk by me, oh, I broke it. If a police officer walks by me, who, who, get, what, like why I am, at least in the, in the US, the assumption is innocent until proven guilty. You know? But I really feel that we are entering this new era of a change in this sort of, uh, in sort of this relationship in which you are not guilty yet, right? But we still want to know where you are where you were, and eventually, we'll get so good that we can map out where you're going to be. So, they are not the only one. A lot of companies, whether it's on social media, Geofedia and other, or in other companies, um, and uh, Veritone and other companies are bringing, are bringing new frameworks of, of uh, processing power of neural networks and, and other machine learning uh, to, to the the tools in which that like have traditionally been rolled out but have been static. And now we're creating a dynamic data collection framework. Um, so the, now we can talk about a little bit about this relationship, right? I mean, so see here that, uh, yeah, that more and more our faces are being recognized. Um, turn, um, so I, I really found this a startling statistic that 68 major city, uh, city departments in the US, um, that two thirds of them have body cameras worn, and, but a lot of them don't, um, we don't really know much about them. There's no transparency around, these, around the way that these uh, tools are being used, and as well, like what happens to the data after the fact? Is there, a, is there a shelf life on this data? Does it get expunged, overwritten at a certain point in time? Or are people just sitting on what, hours into days into months into years of information that can retroactively be an, analyzed? Again, the idea of like no image is static anymore. That all the images that, that are captured by police video cameras can eventually, even if not, we don't have the technology now, can at a later date be repurposed to draw conclusions that weren't technologically available at the time. So right now, how big of a problem is this? 117 million Americans have their face in some sort of database. Most don't know. There are something like 20 states, I believe, in which that are now have not put up a, um, that have willingly put their driver's, data, driver's license databases into the federal level. Very little oversight, and 
as we've seen, sometimes democracy is pretty fucking stupid. And, or at least populations in which they vote on things are not in a position to make an informed decision because of propaganda or because of whatever it may be. But we are holding, we are putting the fate of our faces in, uh, we're putting the fate of our faces in, to institutions in which we not, may not always have our back. So again, are we really still um, innocent until proven guilty or are the systems being created now really making us guilty until proven innocent? Right? I mean, right now there's active research being done in order to identify who's guilty. Again, some minority report shit. This is even further complicated by a few things that now see that Apple and other companies are working on 3D modeling, on, on, three, on taking 2D images and creating a third dimension vector to be able to like see things, project things that might not even be captured by the original frames. We have drones all over the world. We're now, now people are working on um, real-time targets um, and typing manifold algorithms for the, for the United States Air Force. I want to take this moment to say that the, a lot of the times the data sets that are being used on, for these trainings are not neutral data sets. I don't even know if there is something as, as an unbiased data set, but that's a different conversation. 9.30 this evening at re, I think I'm going to be talking about proprietary algorithms, so I'll get into that more then. But I'm really interested in the idea of the scalability, of the, of the proliferation of once this technology is available, whether it's to for an espionage or through uh, private partner, private uh, public partnerships, that this technology will eventually find its way into uh, into ways into ungovernable, untransparent, unaccountable un uh, in systems without oversight. Right now, we may be able to, we may be feel comfortable that there's a chain of command in the U.S. military, and if they're going to use a drone based on some sort of image recognition technology, that there is a high enough confidence in which these are bad people are the, name, the, the words of the president, uh, bad hombres, right? And so, but we have really very little assurance. A lot has been written around, around the mass civilian casualties um, undertaken by especially drone strikes, trying to get one high value target, but inadvertently blew up 50 people at a wedding. So this is, these are things that are not just like, no longer science fiction, they're actively being deployed in battlefields, but they won't stop there. So, as I mentioned earlier, this is one of the things that I think that um, I that I think we need more and more discussion, more, more of a broader conversation about. And this is the ability of a single device with very little uh, with very little connection to a central server, to you know, server farm, to be able to, to perform a more and more advanced, sophisticated technology on the device itself. There are GPUs that are now um, being rolled out that are able to perform some degree of, of neural network um, that really takes the burden away from the processing on, on, at, at home base, at headquarters, at the server. So as more and more work can be done on our devices themselves, it actually decreases the processing load on the server side. And I think that this is also quite interesting in the sense that the miniaturization of these technology is also a threat vector in and of itself that no longer you need massive teraflop to run all these things if you can front load this computing on the, on the device itself and by the time it gets to, uh, to server to the database that like, there's already inferences drawn. Cafe2 from Facebook um, is, is uh, yeah, they've open sourced that recently. Um, so this is out there, yeah? Um, Google's doing it as well. So what is a little remix now and say that right now seeing is believing in some ways, I'd say. That right now we see an image and we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily skeptical of it. But very soon, very, very soon, I believe that we are going to have to question more and more about the images that we see. Right? This is the relationship between us and our technology, and what does it look like to trust an image? Soon our eyes may lie to us. 
The Economist wrote a really interesting piece about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, well, I guess last month, uh, July 1st, it was published. Um, but kind of went into the, um, actually, I was taking a case from Julian Assange and, and saying that, you know, how do we know that one person is who they say they are? What are, what are the resolution? What is the pixel resolution that we need in order to ensure that what we're seeing has not been manufactured, has not been doctored, doesn't have a vector layer on top of it that is, looks like somebody saying something, but is in fact not? This goes hand in hand with the idea of like, um, after one image, as we get more precise about tagging and indexing um, and even creating metadata around images, machines don't no longer are le needing less and less training data in order to quantify um, characteristics, if not state in a human readable form, what something is. Um, this is interesting. There's some interesting work being done on satellite images. Um, and comparing a comparative analysis between time frame, so maybe before a flood and after a flood. But more and more automated systems are going on to match up and see where, um, to see what has changed. And so we're getting, we're doing this from, you know, from low Earth orbit, but at the same time, these same technologies are able to, to be, uh, well, probably eventually be able to rolled out in things like CCTV cameras. Um, I, I mentioned this, like now that we don't actually have to see have our whole face seen by a system, maybe just a profile view. Now the, uh, uh, yeah, that uh, the, the iPhone is now working, um, and I think the iPhone 8 will even have more um, sophisticated technology to be able to, to render and re-render people's faces based on a incomplete sample. So, um, I think this kind of gets to, to what I really want to kind of get across is the emergent, social, the emergent social contract that has been forged between us and our technology is, under, is operating under asymmetric pretenses. That my relationship te to technology is not the same as technology's relationship to me. That our physical bodies have a contract with technology, even if we don't know it. And this, is the, this comes in the form of captured Im images, the services rendered, locations, but we're never really able to peer inside and see the technology that sees us. So quickly, who is developing a lot of this? On the private side, Magville in China. Face++. Plus Plus. Uh, Blipper, which is, a, which is augmented reality, but it's also using facial, also facial recognition technology. Um, and FindFace, which is creepy as fuck. Um, Fineface uses the VK, um, um, the large uh, Facebook clone in Russia, and it has been used um, to basically identify. So the, the two male co-founders basically said, um, in the part of their marketing scheme, you can take a photo of anybody, run it through our system, and then you can find the profile of that cute girl that you saw at the bar and discover what she's into. It's really creepy, and if we look at to, if we look at um, these how these uh, how these facial recognition the real time face recognition um, is being marketed, people are smiling, and it's it's women like here oh oh this is something like this is interesting, but there's very much a what I feel is a a phenomenon which is unhealthy that there are. Males, there are tech bros, if you will, designing technology, rolling out marketing strategies, and but it's not giving people the chance to say, hey, maybe I don't want to be in this system. Just because I have a VK profile or maybe just because I have a Facebook profile does not mean that I've consented to be discoverable in public. But this technology rolls on. Um, there's some really interesting stuff going on with um, uh, facial recognition when it or image recognition in the human body, um, automated uh, dermatologists, um, superhuman vision, these sort of things. Uh, this was going to the point I was saying that like there is real world replication bias or that, that, the, that the bias that occurs in real life also has a knock on effect and has a replication a bias inside of our technologies. If we have no black people, if we have no people from, uh, of, of, we have no women inside of a database that 
it is going to be less and less precise with that less training data. But who is investigating? Who, who are our data interrogators? Who are our data ethnographers? Currently, I, I, I exist that we don't have, we have not built these, these roles into a de technological development cycle. That we have to do more as, as activists and as actors to think about like, how do we inject a, a stronger, a stronger safeguards into, um, into these systems, but as well, how do we make sure that the data that we're using to, for testing and for training is as objective as it can be? So there are some things that we're doing. As more and more glasses and patterns come online, there are some really interesting ways to resist. Silicon Valley has been a little more open to the idea of, of, of bringing philosophers into, into the loop. But, said, so the consequences of failure. So, the replication of historical inequalities, the undermining of democratic and judicial institutions, profit maximization as a basis of future technological development, amplification of a global, global technological hegemony that is able to rival nation states. The removal of humans as the primary decision-making force and the proliferation of lethal autonomous weapon systems laws. So, I just have a couple slides left. I'm gonna open them for a couple minutes of quick Q&A, but uh, if anybody has any questions, I can start thinking about them now. So, some things around, um, just these are, I, I would not say these are my, my thesis to, to combat these sort of things, but more, more food for thought. That we have to do more in the due diligence of diversity. We need to bring more people and more backgrounds um, into the decision-making process to turn a critical eye onto the, the systems that are being created. Do we want technology to follow something like the Hippocratic Oath that's used in medicine, to do no harm? Do we want to, to, still, to distill into the technological DNA of machines to not, to not kill, to not do harm? What about the Magna Carta as a defining character, as a defining, um, as something to build uh, theoretical technology on? Do we want the idea of, of that you, in order to be found guilty, that somebody, that a judge has to find you guilty? Um, and what about the uh, new valuation system? How do we put a value on this technology when advertising and surveillance have their own revenue streams? What does it mean? How do we put humans back at the center of the equation? So, if, we're gonna, if humans are going to be out of the loop, which I hope they will not be, but the introduction of digital imaging into AI has brought about a new type of a relationship. It, the proprietary nature, which I'm most scared about, but even when it comes to open source, it's very difficult to sometimes audit code, but even taking proprietary AI that uses our images to formulate opinions about us, to drive, that tries to nudge and drive our habits and define our identity. If a state did this, if an, in a state structure, we would probably be up in arms, but because this has happened under the surface, because we don't see this now, it's not, this is not front page headlines. This is not protests in the street. And so unless we can create a new way to give humans the capacity to have sovereign power over their image, the social contract of the future will not be negotiated with a unified entity, but with a multiplicity of for-profit technology that are oftentimes non-state actors. So in a few years, if we have Amazon drones flying overhead, and we have Tesla's Lyfts and Ubers all driving by, and we're in the backgrounds of selfies, both on iPhones, Androids, being uploaded to Facebook and Instagram, these are what I call, it is what I call a, private, a distributed privatized governance framework, which for me to have to try to get any one record, a sponge, to arbitrate that I'm saying, I don't want this image in your database, I can't just... I can't negotiate with technology in general. I have to negotiate, if I can, and even now there's not any solid way to do this, negotiate with each of these different corporate actors. And I find that very problematic and something that I think that we have to elevate as far as our calls to a more open and transparent technological future. We have to reevaluate what we feel comfortable with when it comes to the social contract. All right, well, 
that's all I have. If anybody has any questions, I think we have a couple of minutes still. Um, questions, comments, thoughts? We can uh, chat now. First of all, thank you. Scary, but quite interesting. <laughs> well, let me say this. I do, I do believe that we can make a better future. I am not jaded. I think that although the powers of the world, that <laughs> companies with half a trillion dollar market capitalizations and nation states that have the capacity to end all human life, these are big challenges. But I'm not resigned to the fact that this is going to be the 21st century. And I think together, working on philosophical and ethical frameworks, the idea of at what, do, what level are we comfortable with enforcement being able to mandate transparency inside of proprietary algorithms is going to be a large conversation, but it's something we have to start now. Please line up at the, please line up at the microphones. Hey, um, thank you, great talk. For, I, I missed the beginning of it, but um, then again, I'm also in this field and I know a lot of things you talk about. Um, and uh, it's funny to see someone, usually I'm on stage saying this, and now it's someone else, that's really interesting. Uh, but I wanna, what that led to me was to give some feedback, which was, um, you say that the, the human is out of the loop, but what I found is that, describe it's math washing, is that the human is not really gone, it's just hidden, right? It's, it's, these algorithms are designed by people who you know, are to a degree self-learning, but also to a degree designed by which data goes in. So these, they're not really gone, they're just hidden. So if, in that sense, they are still accountable. Humans can still be held accountable to that, and we could still, yeah. So they're there to a degree. So I'd say like two things on that. One, I think it's interesting if we're looking at the causal, uh, we're looking at uh, technology on a, on a chronological, a time axis. There are humans that are intermediary dispersed. So we have the coders and the programmers, those who deploy these systems, people that are used checking in to like see what information they want, whether it's police, you know, body cameras or whatever. Um, but I think that once this technology gets out into the wild, that the human capacity decreases because of the automated dashboards now. Now, I mean, these Geophedia and these other social, monitor, social media monitoring uh, platforms are kind of the Pretty much very limited training is required now to use these very sophisticated platforms. So I, I am not saying that humans are completely out of the loop, but at the same time, we're making more and more user-friendly tools that decrease the amount of technological know-how to use them, um, and they're able to also export. I mean, we talk about Vasanar and like uh, malware, you know, like uh, cyber weapon malware um, research and and ex uh, export licenses, but. That's mostly kind of on the, the digital munitions sort of side of things. But what's to stop a company in the US or China from exporting a very powerful uh, facial recognition platform that requires, that already is there in a dashboard and you just click, here's our target and whatever. So I, I think that I, I absolutely agree, but I think that as technology, we're actually, it's, we're, these systems are being designed for people that are not technologically advanced. Um, secondly, I, I worry that if we have not built in kind of benchmarks in which that data has to be erased, that information has to be reviewed, that the mass accumulation of information inside of, inside of servers has a couple of drawbacks. One, it's uh, vulnerable to being compromised. What happens if with the OPM hack in the US. What happens if, if a massive New York City database gets, gets hacked and now an, a state, an APT, like now is able to, to do their own mapping? And so I think that while there's still room for humans in the loop, humans have been deprioritized and now Israel, China, and Russia are all developing autonomous weapons platforms that need no human interaction. And if this is based on facial recognition targeting systems, I find this that next level of problematic in which that you don't even have to push, nobody has to push a button anymore. And I hope that you didn't get mixed up as somebody else. At least in the US military chain of command, there's quite robust, I mean, it's not perfect and they, they're really bad at what they do, but um, with the civilian casualties that are caused around, it's, but there's now actively by nation states working to create systems that further bring humans out of the loop. Um, I, I definitely agree, but I think that if we are able to institutionalize in kind of in a social contract way, what we expect technology 
to, how do we expect it to be accountable, not just to those who make it or deploy it, but to the people that it inadvertently captures along the way? I think we're just talking about different levels of the, of the question, where I'm talking about the design phase, where there's still a lot of possibility for accountability, and I understand also that in the user phase that it becomes more opaque. Well, and I think that the, the, the development phase is where really probably we can make the largest amount yep. of impact. Once it's in the wild, it's very hard to recall these things, but if we think more about some, the idea of a, a data ethnographer, why, why does Facebook not, you know, when they're, you think they're rolling, <laughs> I know maybe things are dictated by the policy teams or the global standards teams, but what about, yeah, the data investigator, to what, like how, and as we're combining these databases or building them on top of each other, where maybe the columns <laughs> fit, okay, well, that's that, but what does it mean if, for, for example, New York City, stop and frisk. If you were to take this data and pull it in, I, Kate Crawford and uh, Kathy Noah have talked a bit about this, if you were just to rely on something like New York City crime statistics, you might see, oh, wow, actually young men of color are exponentially more likely to have a weapon or drugs on them. But if you don't wait for the idea of stop and frisk, this law that, give, that gave police officers the ability to go up to anybody suspicious and pat them down, then we're not properly waiting for the, tr the, the way that the, uh, that the cultural biases have replicated into the digital form. So I think that it's important that we start thinking, okay, well, what does it mean to be a data philosopher, a data ethnographer, a data interrogator? And, and to me, this is like where we need more diversity of humanities and other fields into STEM fields in order to make it a much more rounded, yeah, vibe. No one else wants to ask a question. I've got a second one. Um, so my second question is, um, or nuance would be, uh, that a lot of these things are very based on American examples, right? But in Europe, there are currently stronger protections as to, for example, what counts as a, a private piece of data and what counts as an identifiable piece of information. So um, perhaps that's a good or a hopeful part of it is that in, in, at least in Europe, there seems to be uh, uh, some degree of, uh, you know, first like a fine face could not happen in Europe. Right? That, that would not be okay. Um, so that might be helpful. So, I mean, I think it will be interesting to see um, the final form of the GDPR, um, the idea even with the right to, be, right to an explanation. I think the way that this comes out in case law and in court rulings is going to be quite interesting and consequential. At, well, a, a union like Europe that, has, that is a major economic market for, uh, for these companies really, I think, has to be a leader. The U.S. has no political capital. There's this revolving door between the Washington and Silicon Valley, and the corporate capture is really quite startling. Other places, that China and India are now becoming surveillance states. So I think that Europe is kind of, you know, help us, EU. You're our only hope. Um, but I think that things like the right to explanation, and once we get into the, the, the devils and the details, to what degree do, are there, is, is, a, is a judge or a panel, or, you know, European Court of Human Rights, or just as what is the case, what is the test case? And so I think this is actually a, a I, mean, I guess I'm now advocating for strategic litigation. That now we need to start thinking about the ways that we're going to use the impending, especially GDPR, um, but, other, but other things and, and taking cases from other case law and things. How are we going to, as activists and as, as actors, how are we going to frame these issues um, I think the EFF and Access, and there's some organizations that are working on these things on the larger level um, in their respective fields. But for me, um, the, I think that we now need to be thinking about seeing, like, ex expanding the next two to three to five years of strategic litigation, strategic litigation um, targeted advocacy, um, strategic lobbying. How are we going to like push this over and to make sure that the right to explanation which I think is particularly practical or applicable here, because if, de if decisions are made about you using only your face in an automated you know, way that this gives maybe there's somebody a standing in order to bring a case. Um, and there's other things in it, but I, I find that it is now the time that we need to start talking about how do we use the progressive policies that Europe is rolling out in a way that ensures and is actually kind of corners um, technology companies to, if they're going to roll this out in Europe, maybe it's easier, it gives them cover to roll it out with protections globally. Very hopeful about is that, um, 
uh, I'm very hopeful about is that I'm starting to see that this um, field, this market, is well. They have to have to use what they got. For example, there was a, a two weeks ago there was some news about people who got a physical mail, like you know, through their letterbox, about a skin condition they had, and they had only looked it up on the internet. So the connection was that there was are now uh, companies that will connect your the online anonymous browser with the real person who is you know, where they live. And then and that, and they are now sending those mails. So the point there is that people will start to see this invisible thing because they will start to get targeted quite rigorously. And then they will hopefully uh, awake, get awoken. And my personal hope is that as the market for, as people become aware of this, there will be a growing market for privacy enhancing technologies that you know, protect them in any way or that this debate will come uh, in the next 10 years. The, the first example that I was similar to that was Target, the supermarket kind of a household goods store in the US, uh, was one of the first companies to run like a, a pretty comprehensive data analysis on its customers trying to find patterns. And, and they found that, and there was a large case around this was when somebody got um, coupons for baby diapers um, that did not even know they were pregnant, but they had run the diagnostics on a big data scale to be able to like identify who was shopping, who was in these trends. And so, it's only when it kind of, inter excuse me, when only when it kind of enters into our world we get like, wait, wh how do they know something I don't know? And I think that this is again part of this social contract. We have our original instance that were captured. We have who we are now, and a lot of times we are throughout to right now. I think we've been seeing these two points: me now and me then as this relationship, but the ability to extrapolate and forecast information about these relationships and to be able to predict what we're gonna do tomorrow, this is something that I hope there will be some sensational stories because otherwise I think for enough people that will be able to pass under the radar, um, but it's a very, but I think this really is what it comes down to. With this, all this information, is not just about what we're doing, but gives them the power to predict what we're going to do tomorrow. And not just predict, but by quantifying our identity as a user, non-user, subscriber, non-user, it puts us in a box, which ultimately enables them to put hindrances and burdens in our path to influence our agency. And this is really, I think for me, one of the things that we are slowly ceding our individual agency, our personal sovereignty to corporations and other interests when we don't even know that they were involved in our decision-making process. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, as you said, you have another talk later on that goes, I think, a bit more into the algorithm side of those yes. things. So if you are interested, it's in... 9.25 at RE okay. or PA, the other, not, yeah. not here. Yeah. Look it up, look up the speed car. So please, one more thanks for our speaker, Matthew Stender.